Well, it's good to be here with you. Thank you, Devin and worship team. Welcome. I hope you uh, had some relief this week from the heat. Maybe you went to the beach or uh, just stayed in the AC. Welcome to Michigan, right? Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite all kids, all younger kids, and not going to junior church up here up front, we're going to do a little children's message. Growing up, we did a children's sermon, so I'd like to, I'd like to bring something out here. So, Joe and Pete, my kids, and just sit on the steps here. Yeah, Quinn, come on up. If you're upstairs, you can come on down. If you're downstairs, you can come on up. Come on down. Come over here. Come on, sit in the steps. I have to look at my notes because I didn't memorize this. All right, so you guys have heard of show and tell, right? You guys, keep, come on up. Come on up. You guys know what show and tell is? Well, we're going to do show and tell. I'm going to show you something, and you tell me what it is. All right? Um, we, in our home, we can't have pets. I don't know. Do you guys have pets? You, you guys have some pets? Okay. We don't really have any pets, but we can go outside and get some pets. And um, I brought some creatures here. Do you guys know what uh, an entomologist is? No. Okay. What is it? Say entomology. entomology. That's what we're going to do here. All right. Okay. And I'm going to explain that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a pet I found. Come on up. Come over here. Okay. And you guys can pass this around. All right. Okay. And, um, let's see here. Oh, oh, it's okay. Um, come on up, come on up. All right, so what should I name this pet? I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is? What? We don't know. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. So what is this? Look around. A butterfly. It's a butterfly. Good job. So you named the first one. There you go. Okay, I got, an, I got another one. Okay. This, is, this, this could be a couple, okay? All right? So this one, we don't have to worry about getting out. What's in here, okay? And don't smell it. It's not a worm. It's not a bug. It's not a, not a stink bug. Roly-poly. Here, pass this, pass this around. Just don't dump it out. Okay, roly-poly. I love that name, roly-poly, right? Okay, what about this right here? What's in here? You gotta look, you look closely. It is empty. I, I didn't have time to fill this one, so. <laughs> All right. I think I, I got a couple more. Okay, here's, here's another one. I got, I got two in here. You gotta look, not a caterpillar. A cricket. A cricket, yep. And what else? Yep, you can. There's something else in there. Look on the lid. Look up, up, upside down on the lid. Do you see anything in there? A slug. That's right. A cricket and a slug. All right. Here's the last one. You guys show. Let everyone see it. Okay. Here we go. Does anyone know what? There's a bunch of fireflies. Lincoln got it. You guys can pass it around. I got a bunch of fireflies. And what's amazing about fireflies? Yeah. Did you guys see any this summer? Yeah, yeah, I saw some. I saw one this a week ago, and it hit my windshield, and all the glow-in-the-dark stuff just stayed there for miles and miles. It was really cool. Isn't God amazing to make all these cool creatures? And entomologists, what they do is they, they name these and study these bugs. That's what these are. Um, how does this relate to this Sunday? Today, Jesus is going to tell us, hey, listen up. Jesus is going to tell us, and it kind of relates to the lightning bug, about his light. He doesn't have a flashlight or glow in the dark. But he's talking about spiritual things. And people are blind to them. We're all born into darkness and blind to this truth. And God opens our eyes so that we see Jesus' light. And he describes that whoever follows him will have a light of life. This is an invitation for us that we get to hear today. And what are ways we can follow Jesus? What do you think? Pray, read the Bible. Excellent. Love him. Love him. That's good. Three different ways. There are other ways. Be kind to others. Good. Tell people about God. Those are great answers. 
So one of the, the challenge I, I'm going to give to you is to think about what does God want to, you to do to follow him? All right, so think about that as I talk, as we talk to, about what the Bible says. Think about how, do, how can we follow him this week? And those are some good, good ways, and there's lots of ways. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for the opportunity to follow you. We pray that you help us do that and know what that is and uh, to find the joy of the Lord, our strength in doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat now. Thanks, guys. You did a nice job. Well, today, as you kind of got a preview, sometimes when I was growing up, this was the thing I remembered from the sermon, (laughs) the children's message. Uh, Sam, you can have a seat. Um, We're continuing our series in the Gospel of John. John was a follower of Jesus, and he wrote a a biography of Jesus about 2,000 years ago. And we're in chapter 7 and chapter 8. We're continuing on where we left off last week in verse 53, going to chapter 8, verse 30. There's a lot there. A lot of it's familiar. Jesus is going to talk about where he came from and um, where he's going, who he is, and what he's about. I've asked Eric Munyon to come up front and read for us. There you are. I was like, is he here? He's here. Come on up front. We're going to be reading on page 894 in our Blue Bibles. It will also be on the overhead, so please stand as you're able in honor of God's word. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, They went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I came from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man... Then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Thanks. Let's pray. Dear God, we just ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Are we on? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. I want to set the context. You may have heard something about this before or looking at your Bibles and notice something kind of odd. There's a footnote or a bracket by verse 53. And then at verse 11, you see the same sort of thing in chapter 8. What, what do those mean? What does it mean when it says the earliest manuscripts do not include? That's a good question. Those are good questions I want to touch on, but I'll point you to another pastor for more of a complete answer. The Bible was originally written in ancient Greek and ancient Hebrew over a 1,500-year period with 66 books and 40-some authors on three separate continents. And archaeologists and scholars have pieced together over the last 100 years some of the oldest texts in existence, verifying the thousands and thousands of ancient copies that were used to translate the Bible we hold in our hands today. If you know anything about stuff, how it molds, it fades, breaks, and disappears, you can imagine how the Bible has suffered over the centuries. And so no, no, no original manuscripts exist from 3,500 years ago. But that's not alarming. We have no original manuscripts of Shakespeare. And we don't question whether Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, or King Lear were written by him. God, who created this world from the bugs to us, can do what he wants and reveal himself in ways and words however he desires. And he's preserved it with his power, miraculously. The most recent finds in the last hundred years concur with ancient manuscripts that predate some of these old manuscripts they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, triangulating and corroborating the original text with a certainty that you and I can stake our lives on. People have, and I would. We believe the Bible is the only book, the only book in human history that is divinely inspired. God took normal people and spoke through them using their voices, and the Word has a unique role of encouragement and direction for our lives. It answers important questions like, how did we get here? And what's the point? And where are we going? What happens after we die? It provides morality and a reason for charity and hope for eternity. Internally, you'll find it's consistent and historically verifiable. It talks about people and places that you can read about outside the Bible and you can even visit. Uh, Dave Smelter said he's visited Israel uh, and doing some studies there. You could too. How then do the translators add these brackets and footnotes and a phrase the earliest manuscripts don't include? Well, they're trying to be honest and point out what we know from different ancient documents. Nothing in these 12 verses contradict the rest of the Bible. The story fits with how the Pharisees are treating Jesus. They're trying to test him. It fits with Jesus' message of grace and repentance. It fits with a wise response. We could spend more time trying to explain and unpack this. I think I want to point you to John Piper and a sermon he did on those 12 verses. You can Google John Piper and those verses and find out his academic take. But let me say this. This illustrates, these verses illustrate very well where we're going this morning. If you were here last week, we were talking about the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles in John chapter 7. It's a week-long national holiday that the Jewish people were celebrating. On the last day of the great feast, the great day, the high priest carried water in a golden flask. He had wine and water in two different flasks, and he carries this water through the water gate of the temple in Jerusalem. Horns are blowing, and the choirs are singing the psalms, and the priest pours out the water, symbolizing God's miraculous provision in the history of the people of God. The water also symbolizes the future outpouring of his Holy Spirit on the people. At this point, Jesus stands up and offers an invitation and a new interpretation. He invites the people to come to him and satisfy, to slake their thirst. He would provide salvation for all who would believe. And he would save them from death and offer them life and a Holy Spirit flowing out of them like a river of water. But that was not the only symbol during this celebration. It's not the only symbol that he identifies with. At the end of the first day of the feast, the temple was marvelously illuminated. Some sources say it was done every night. According to tradition, four gigantic 
candelabras or torches stood up 75 feet tall. Four branches were on each of these tall poles with large bowls. And four young men would climb ladders to the top of these 75 feet tall candelabras and fill them with 10 10 gallons of oil and then light them on fire. And, And I have a picture. You got a picture there? So... That's a picture of one of the candelabras, the huge lamps. And envision 16 different bowls filled with fire in in an area where there's no light pollution. And if you remember Jerusalem in your geography, it's set on a hill. It's a city on a hill. Mount Moriah is specifically where the temple is. And so from a distance, you could see this light shining. It was a glorious light. The glow stood out. It was reflective of the glory of the Lord that, that descended on the tabernacle when they were journeying through the wilderness to the promised land. It's also representative of the fire that led the people of Israel in, the, in their wilderness journey to the promised land. And it's in this setting that chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of light. I am the light of the world. What audacity. Who is this? Let's look and see. Jesus says, I am. This isn't a simple declaration of who he is. This is code for Yahweh. Jesus is making himself one with God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses meets with God in a burning bush. You may remember the story. He's looking for clarity about who God is. Moses grew up, not with a Jewish background, but in the Egyptian Roman, or the Egyptian court, the polytheistic state. He was an adoptive child of royalty, the son of Pharaoh. And the Egyptians had all kinds of gods. The sun god, Ra, the Nile god, Hapti, and others. Who is this god that speaks to him in a burning bush? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, we find out. We find out this. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say to this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And Jesus' generation is no exception. I am, he said. One source I read said centuries before the Jews became very concerned with not blaspheming the name of the Lord. So rather than saying the name Yahweh or I am, they would say the name Elohim, which is Hebrew for the word God. However, this didn't solve the problem. Was they're reading their Bibles, their Torah, they're seeing this word Yahweh, what do they say? So they come up with the vowels uh, from Yahweh and they say Adonai. Adonai, which is Lord. So they mean Lord when they say, when they read Yahweh. So the culture does everything they can to avoid blaspheming the Lord, God, Yahweh, and they don't say I am. And Jesus here is saying, I am. And they probably, they probably knew what he was getting at when he said it. You know, today Christians and some in our culture have a problem with saying God is a filler word. They do that out of respect. God gave us ten commandments, ten rules to live by. He gives them to Moses. And one of them is do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So we're not to, we're not to just throw around God's name. And I think that's a good idea. I think in general people in the United States are respectful. But the U.S. used to be more respectful. And even in that, the current laxity and the past laxity of our day is dramatically different than Jesus' day. Let me, let me illustrate this. Here, here Jesus says, I am. And I think it's disturbing. 
He said it before, and he's going to say it again. It's not an accident. He's not confused or careless with his words. He speaks with a purpose. The first time he said this, he actually said this before, in chapter 6, verse 35 and verse 48. He says, I am the bread of life. I am. I am the bread of life. Now, now maybe when they look at verse 12 and they hear that for the first time, it doesn't strike them so blasphemously. But by the end of his speech, and we'll get to this next week, we will see that he is, he is bringing on death upon himself. The leadership lose control. Look at verse 58 and 59 in chapter 8. 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I said, say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they pick up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why do they want to stone him? It's because he's blaspheming the name of the Lord. Jesus was more than a great teacher. He's more than a miracle worker. He's more than a prophet. He's more than a moral genius. He was God in flesh, the living word of God. He was revelation revealed. John began his biography with this introduction. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the Word of God, and the Word was God. And here he says, I am. I am the light. In the Psalms, there's a beautiful song of praise to God. Psalm 36 says this, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds, Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. In your light, Do we see light? And what does that mean? How do we see light in light? I think it relates to what Jesus said about himself when he describes himself as the light. How do we see light in light? I think there's a way in which God's light opens our ability to see other lights from a new perspective as they really are. I think that's what Jesus is saying about himself. I picture walking, walking on a home tour, a better homes and gardens type home is, appears before you. It's large and beautiful with great gardens and it's well lit and, and you're invited to go inside. And as you enter this house with amazing opulent furniture and co- the color and design is just grand, the functionality is amazing, each room is something more to discover and exciting as the... Movement opens up a newness and freshness to the world around us. So light opens us up to a newness and awareness before us. Jesus unlocks the blind eyes and darkened minds. He is the light. He said, I am the light. I am the light. I am the light of the world. He didn't say, he could say to this audience, he could say, I am the light of the Jewish nation. I am the light of Israel. But no, he says, I am the light of the world world, the light of the nations. He said this before about himself in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And may we never forget this. May we never forget these verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I think people generally think of their nation as the greatest nation on the planet. Think of Russia, or Korea, or China, or Canada, or America. If you follow politics, I bet both parties are going to claim or have claimed that America is great and the greatest place on the planet. 
It's natural and normal. And the Jewish nation isn't an exception. Literally, they were the only people that God chose. They were the chosen people. He had a personal relationship with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Consequently, they had a sense of spiritual superiority. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he busts down their xenophobic arrogance and their nationalistic pride, pointing to himself and to the world and himself being the light of the world. This certainly seems like an invitation to all people from every language, not a select chosen group of people, to every tribal group, to every nation state. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever, whoever, whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of light, life. Jesus' words contrast those gigantic lamps that burn so brightly. Their representation of a pillar of fire giving people something to follow by God is contrasted with Jesus and his offer. They were following people these, during this holiday. They were following their tradition. They were following their religion. They were following their practices of their fathers and forefathers before them. They were doing what they always did. They were doing their duty. And they're probably really good at it, right? They sacrificed money and time and they traveled a distance to get to Jerusalem to be a part of this celebration. And here Jesus comes with a different take on their gathering. He contrasts what had been going on for centuries by the establishment and invites a followership of himself. He doesn't soften his message. This is a directly counter to what the religious leaders wanted to hear. How did the elites handle this confrontation, this competition, this declaration of divinity. This, this pep rally was not supposed to be about Jesus. What was their response? What's their response in the text? Look at verse 13. They outright denied whatever Jesus claimed. Jesus, you're lying. You're a liar. You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. There's two different perspectives come to loggerheads here in verses 13 through 20. Jesus doesn't agree. How do we deal with conflict? How do we deal with conflict? There's a time to, to overlook or ignore. There's a time to change one's mind and to capitulate. And there's a time to confront. And, and that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to confront this right now. He will not back down. He will not be quiet. He begins in verse 14 with what they share in common. They shared Moses. Moses was the leader of Israel in their escape from Egypt to the journey to the promised land. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. God commanded him or inspired him and led him. Both Jesus and the Pharisees believe this. They get this. They could agree on that. Moses teaches at one point that no accusation should be brought against another person without two witnesses. So if you want to make a claim that they're lying, that he's lying, or whatever, you need to back it up. You need to prove it. So Jesus backs up his assertion. He defends himself. He has two witnesses. Who are his witnesses? Who are his witnesses? Him and his father. That's right. It seems a bit circular, but they don't, they see he's, he's representing himself, but they stick on this father thing. They go to eliminate his father. Who, who is this father you're talking about, they ask. They probably thought he was talking about the biological stepdad, Joseph. Jesus made it plain. He's not. They, the way Jesus sounds is similar to his past arguments. If you listened to last week or read last week's passage, it sounds very similar. I bet you they didn't plan the conversation going this way. In verses 21 and 30, Jesus brought more definition of who he was and where he's going. Look at verse 21. What does Jesus say? I'm going away and you will seek me. You will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you can't come. Isn't that interesting? What what sticks out to you about that verse? Does it strike you as similar to chapter 7? 
you look at chapter 7, verse 33, I don't have this projected, but 33 and 34 says this, I'll be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. They're strikingly alike. Maybe you notice in this text something else, something different. What does he mean you will die in your sin? That's a good question. They don't understand. They don't pick up on this. They don't pick, on his, pick up on his death, they, or his, their death. They think of his death. So that in verse 22, it says, the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says where I'm going, you cannot come? So, so is, is Jesus talking here about suicide? Is that what he's talking about? No, he's not talking about suicide. He's res- he responded and pointed back to his comment on death. Life and death are at stake here. Jesus will respond to their question. This is a serious matter. But not because Jesus is going to die, but because they're going to die. Look at verse 23. He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. I told you that you, will die, you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The reality is the people were walking in the darkness. They were blind. They didn't realize Jesus was calling out their sin of unbelief and the ultimate result of sin, death. They were worshiping a God of their own invention, neglecting the God before them. They were comfortable. They weren't open to change. They didn't have open minds. They had closed minds. No room for the living God to interrupt them and surprise them with the truth. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, It's appointed for man to die once, and then after that comes the judgment. The reality is, the Bible says, we're all going to face a judgment. Justice will be served. And Romans 6.23 tells us about that justice, saying the wages of sin is death. It's the physical and spiritual death. Death is the just result of sinning against a holy God. And in verse 24, Jesus picks up on this. He knows this. He teaches this. He says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This is critical. Jesus is offering light and life. To neglect it is to embrace death and darkness. And the Pharisees are living in death row right now and don't know it. In 350 B.C., a man by the name Plato wrote a thoughtful work called The Republic. In his seventh chapter, he writes an allegory, a story about something. And you may have heard it before. He talks about Socrates, a philosopher, talking to one of his students, Glaucon. And he tells him a story, a story within the story, about a people that are chained from their earliest memory to their dying day, facing a wall. They they can't move. All they see is the wall in a cave deep in the recesses of the earth. And behind them are a group of people carrying objects and talking and muttering and saying different things. And behind them, even further out, is a fire. The fire casts a light on those people carrying objects. And as they carry those objects, the shadows are cast on the wall. And and the people chained from this extraordinary existence, from birth or from the earliest memory, they see these shadows and they hear the echoes of the murmuring and and talking of the people. And they they suppose that these shadows are are talking because the, the noise reverberates off that wall, right where the shadows are. That's their reality. And Socrates then supposes one of the prisoners is freed, forced to turn and see the fire. The light, the light would hurt his eyes and make it hard to see the objects that are casting the shadows. And then if this prisoner is told, you know what, this is real. The light is real and these objects are real. What you saw before is only a shadow. It's only a, a mirage, an image. It's not the real thing. This is the real thing. In his pain, the freed prisoner wouldn't believe. And he would struggle and turn away and run back to what he knew, to the shadow of things. 
Socrates then supposed, say, say we drag this person, we force him up and out of this cave into the light of the sun. The prisoner would be angry because he'd be in worse pain than before. But slowly his eyes would adjust to the light and at first he could only see shadows. And gradually he would see people, faces, color, texture, contrast, the trees with the green leaves and the brown bark and the blue sky and the white clouds. He'd see water. He'd experience life in a way that he's never experienced before. Eventually he could take a look at the sun with all its majesty. That freed prisoner would think that the real world, this was superior to the world he experienced in a cave. He, he would bless himself for the change and pity the other prisoners that were with him. And most, probably part of him, would want to go back and tell them and bring them to this reality. Socrates supposes that he goes back. Let's say he goes back. And what happens when eyes are adjusted, the light goes back into the darkness. You can't see anything. And as the prisoners, they see him groping around, not seeing things as clearly as they in the darkness, in the shadows, they would infer that the returning man's blindness, that he'd been harmed. And when he starts talking about this other world, they don't believe him. And Socrates supposes, if, if pushed to face this light, they would kill him. The story was written 300 years, 350 years before Jesus, but it sounds like something we know. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, and this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest his work should be exposed. Let me read that again. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest his work should be exposed. The story of the cave is just a story. The story of Jesus is true. And a religious group of people hated him so much they would test him and test him and try him and kill him. And so in John chapter 7, 53, the Pharisees found a woman caught in sin. They brought her to Jesus in the temple. Maybe one of them was the bait, a lover, a trafficker, or something worse. She's caught, alone in her nakedness and shame before holy men that really aren't that holy. They take the opportunity to test Jesus, hoping for failure. Under the Roman occupation, the law, the law of the land, and the law of Moses were at, were at odds. The law of Moses describes the death penalty for adultery, but it cannot be easily obeyed. For, for Jesus to agree with the law and stone, to stone this woman, to instigate that, it would smack a rebellion against the Roman rule and, usher, and probably usher the death penalty. He'd be issuing his own death warrant, which is exactly what the Pharisees are looking for in this test. On the flip side, if he denies the Mosaic law, he'd be contradicting the word of God and discredit himself before everyone. So what does he do? stoops down and draws in the sand. And they pester him, and they pepper him with questions. And he rises and states, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. The older and wiser knew their past. They were honest with themselves for a change, and they were not right enough to cast the first stone. They, they had work to do, soul searching to do, so they disappear from the oldest to the youngest till only Jesus and the woman was left. Jesus offers her grace, not condemnation or judgment. This story illustrates Jesus is what he's come to offer, grace and a path of repentance. The good news is not that Jesus came to judge the world, but to save it. And it's not that he can't judge the world or won't judge the world. One day he will. Justice will be served. The Bible is clear about that. But his purpose for coming to earth was to offer light and life to all men and women, children and parents, and blacks and whites, and people of all color. What Jesus offers the woman, he offers to us, life and light. We are born and grow up in darkness. Like those in prison in a cave, we see 
but only dimly. And Jesus offers true light to see light. Sin will blossom like death and decay and destruction all around us. We just have to turn on the news to open the paper, listen to the radio, read our feeds, and sin is still with us, isn't it? We feel the hurt of the rebellion of our hearts. And I think we long for what the light and life Jesus offers. So we have a choice. You have a choice this week. Oh, church, will you open your eyes and see God before you? He is the light and life for your soul and offers hope in the darkness. Listen to his word to you. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And many hearing Jesus that day understood enough that verse 30 says they believed in him. Will you believe, brothers and sisters? Will you see, brothers and sisters? Will you follow, brothers and sisters? It looks different for each of us, but it involves three things for all of us. It involves intention. You cannot follow Jesus by accident. You need to make a decision. Who are you following? Do you just do whatever you you want to do? You do what makes you happy? You follow your appetites, drives, and desires? Are you ruled by the path set before you by your parents or your employer or your family? Or are you following God? The following takes intentionality. It's not done by accident. The second thing about following is it involves revelation. How do we know where to go? How do we know what God's way is? The answer is through the Bible, revelation. You have to read it and study it and know it and hear it and think about it. We don't just take a pastor's word for it. We're not directed by a living prophet or our feelings or a popular blog or a talk show. We don't stumble onto truth and just, or just make it up. It seems right. God has revealed truth to us in his word, the Bible. And maybe it's not apparent. Maybe it's difficult to understand. That's where partnering with your D group or G group or life group or your friends or your family and talking about what does the Bible say is critical. It's important for us today. Following involves intention and revelation and involves action. If we really believe something, if we really believe something, we will act on what we believe. 1 John chapter 1 says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you really believe Jesus, you will follow him. You can't believe him and not. Will you follow him, church? Will you follow him, brothers and sisters? That doesn't mean we follow him perfectly. I know that. I know that personally. That's why he came to die. He died to forgive our imperfections and sin. And out of gratitude, let's sin no more. If there's a sin in your heart, you know that sin, let's sin no more and let's follow him today. It's going to look different for different people. One example of what God's revealed, practically speaking, is baptism. This isn't a hobby horse. I'm not making this up. And there's different people in different different denominational perspectives even here. But baptism is important. He commands it. And so let's... Not take my word for it. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and following. This is Jesus' last commands he imparts to his followers. If you're following, he says this to you. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Do you believe? If you believe... Obey. Jesus calls us to demonstrate our belief by following him. We can follow him through being baptized would be one example. It's not a ritual. We just do a habit or an optional thing. We practice this because the Bible teaches it. It's symbolic that we're dying to following our own way, and we're going to follow Christ. We want to follow his word. 
And so if you're interested, there's more information in your bulletin to take that public step. But that's, many of you have been baptized or aren't ready for that. I understand that. But that's not the only command he gives us. In that, those same verses, he has a path for all of us. We can all hear Jesus' last command and ask ourselves, are we following him this week? What else does he command in this text, whether you're baptized or not? One command I see here is we're supposed to spread his teaching. How are we doing obeying that invitation? Who are you sharing Jesus with? Like the story of those imprisoned in the cave, God's calling us to share this light of our life with others who live in the darkness. We were there. That can be hard. It can be painful. It can be scary. You know, they killed Jesus for sharing this, and they can, they can kill and crucify us too. But friends, it, he's worth it. There are a thousand more ways to obey him this week. I, I don't know what he's calling you to do this week, but he's calling you to follow him. What does it look like? Pray about it. That'd be my challenge to you is to pray about it. Each day is a new day of mercy. The past doesn't have to dictate our, our present or future. We don't have to be stuck in yesterday's sin. Make change today. Jesus is worth it. He is the only hope and light and life. And let's follow with intention and revelation and action. We pray with me. Dear God, we need your help. Because there are areas in our lives that we don't want to confront, we don't want to deal with. There's areas we are unaware of where we want to sin no more. We want to follow you, and where we don't want to, we want to want to. Help us in that journey to put off sin, and help us in that journey to put on the the obedience to the commands to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to do as the kids were talking about, praying and seeking you in your Bible. Lord, help us to that end. And we thank you that you are a personal God who, who appears to us in the pages of your word to call us to yourself. We pray you, you continue to do that and do that for, for people who maybe haven't, you haven't done that yet today uh, in their hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.